since then. Then I, I came back, let's say, to Europe after many years in the United States. I started interactive television at RAI, the Italian television in Italy. I came to Geneva working for the EBU, which is the uh, European Broadcasting Union, the consortium of all the public service broadcasters uh, in Europe and uh, associates around the world, the biggest broadcasting um, company in the world. And there I was the head of future media and strategy, still emerging media. And uh, then uh, I started to teach at Webster. And a few years ago, we started a VR course. Now it's included in all in other courses. Um, but again, I was not really happy. So I enrolled in a PhD and I was doing a PhD on uh, uh, emerging media and uh, the future of media. But then I attended Singularity University who gave me the ecosystem of the emerging technology at large, robotics, AI and genetics. So I came back, I resigned, I kept teaching at Webster and I decided to focus on emerging technologies and actually ethics. So what I do, I make students reflect on the consequences, positive and negative consequences of emerging technologies, and in particular of emerging technologies connected to media and communication. I wrote a book, which is Exponential Ethics, that was uh, uh, translated in Chinese, because, as Dominic said, I teach also in China. And here at Webster, I focus on emerging media and the future of communication. So tonight, what are we going to do? We are going to talk about digital trends for 2020 and beyond. But in a sense, we are going to talk about digital communication threats to watch out for, because these are really impacting digital marketing domains. Uh, let me give you first some trends of digital communication trends. Uh, the first one that we need to mention is connected engagement. What's the meaning of that? It means that um, companies, brands, they do not stop communicating with the customer once they have bought the product or enrolled in a service. They keep going with device that are connected, like the Fitbit, like Apple Watch, and etc. Why? Because they want to keep the engagement going. You know that now we do not stop with marketing just when the campaign is finished, but the campaign is never finished. So connected engagement is something that we should reflect on. Another very important trend that is um, uh, happening now in 2020, started actually a little bit before, but now in 2020, it's really strong, is that we are going from screens to senses. What's the meaning of that? It means that now advertisers and, uh, let's say, communication and even marketing is considering how to engage senses, because technology now can allow us to do it and artificial intelligence as well. It's enabling to shift from browser or app interaction to interaction with our senses. How do we do that? We have technology that can reenact tact, that can actually make us smell some, there are a few devices that you can connect to the iPhone that allows you to smell, and to enhance your experience, etc. So from screen, senses is something really really important to know in 2020 and beyond another one that we should consider is that people are starting to live social uh, consumers are using more tools for a digital detox, as myself as well um, i'm trying to screen how much time i am on my mobile that uh, what does it mean it means that Digital marketing should also rely a little bit on analog marketing because people are leaving kind of social grounds, but at the same time, when you do a campaign, you need to consider the timing and how to do it. And you need to consider that people, consumers, are not going to stay there 24 hours a day or let's say all day long like 
we used to do that before. Another important trend is that audio now, for example, in journalism, but not only in journalism, is becoming a tool used by almost everybody. Podcast is becoming very strong, especially in journalists, in businesses. So we should consider to know how to actually implement podcasts. And then the platformization, platforms to video and TV. We know that the platforms like Netflix, Apple TV, Facebook, Screen, and et cetera, is actually driving the video distribution. This is something else that we should consider. You know that Netflix, for example, um, initiated a, <laughs> a terrible, for me, a kind of attitude that when you have something that you like, you don't watch only one episode, but you watch everything. It's called binging. So this is something that we should also focus on. And the last one is the fact that the math is coming. What's the meaning of that? I mean, it's the time when the madman, you know, it's not only madman uh, like the series of Madison Avenue and advertisement, but in a sense, the, the, let's say the big boss of communication are starting to hire madmen. What's the meaning of that? Men and women, of course, uh, that are managing data because more and more data is becoming vital. Data and, of course, artificial intelligence. I'd like to show you now something that is a little scary, but it's a, an interesting exercise. This is, in general, a media and entertainment jobs that include this list. I would like to show you how artificial intelligence is actually going to replace partially or in totality these jobs. For example, reporters, what do you think? Artificial intelligence can actually replace them. Yes, and I'll show you later how. Correspondents, no, because correspondents usually they give their own opinion. So they do editorials. So correspondent is going to be. There. News hosts, absolutely yes, and you'll see it. Broadcast news analysis, of course, analyze data. AI is better than human still. So they will go. Writers as well. Now we have software that writes uh, almost like humans. I was reading this morning that OpenAI, which is a company run by Elon Musk, uh, they just, uh, and uh, 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 published a software which is able not only to write articles but can mimic journalists that we like so the style of writers which is really scary but we need to know we need to know that this tool exists because otherwise we are going to to be in this list so writers unfortunately they will be probably partially replaced Authors as well, editors. <clears throat> I've seen a couple of movies, movies edited by AI. I didn't like them at all because they missed human touch, but AI can do it. Photographers, no, because photographers are like correspondents. It's their personal eye that is on stake. Graphic designer, they could. Translator, for sure. We are going to have little device inside the, our ears that will allow us to actually hear languages that we don't know translated completely. Film and video editors, unfortunately, yes, partially. Camera operators, no, like photographers. Broadcast and sound engineer, partially, yes. Announcer, yes. Producer, no. And performers, actor, musician, and composer, they could be replaced. I, and if you go to OpenAI, which is, uh, as I told you, a company run by Elon Musk. I was reading that now they have a system that can create music to your taste. I didn't try yet, but imagine. I mean, it's, it will create a disruption that is gigantic. So what is going to be, in your opinion, the actual uh, skill of 21st century? Because now we have artificial intelligence that is coming. 
is coming in many, many domains. Uh, let me just tell you briefly that artificial intelligence is divided in three levels. One is artificial narrow intelligence, which is a Siri. Inside the smartphone, you have artificial intelligence that is narrow, ANI. Then you have artificial general intelligence, AGI, which is the, intellig the artificial intelligence that wants to be the same, similar to us. So a, a system that can recognize its individuality can act and function by memories, can also be sociable. We are not doing that, we are not able to do that. And then there is the third one that is artificial so, um, super intelligence, which is the one that is the scary one. I don't believe we are going to achieve that. It's another discussion, but it's the scary one. How can we actually face the advent of artificial intelligence with power? with creativity. Creativity is going to be the number one skill in the 21st century. Because uh, even though technologies say that artificial intelligence can be created, it's not. Artificial creativity means that we humans can be created because we are impacted by the serendipity of the outside. And she cannot do that. So creativity is going to be still the most important skill for the human, uh, let's say, race. So let me talk a little bit about AI journalism. Why do I want to talk about that? Because um, if it impacts journalism, it's going to impact also marketing. AI journalism now is becoming very, very uh, popular. Uh, hello. Um, very popular. Um, the most important publication company use uh, AI for assembling data, but mostly they use it also for creating articles. It's called automated journalism or also algorithmic journalism or robot journalism. Before I talk about it, I would like to show you a video because Google is working on that. Sorry. Uh, and let, 
later, when I finish, I would like to know what do you think about it? Because in my opinion, it's a little scary, this, but we will talk about it later. So now, what they say is that they use AI to aggregate information. Some content organizations are trying to do um, some uh, reports for uh, stakeholders, but unfortunately, some organizations are already um, uh, generating entire articles from scratch. And let me tell you a little um, exercise I've done a few days ago, because you can go online and find these AI uh, writers, uh, which you could test, actually. Um, I wrote, uh, you, we put just a few lines, and after some minutes, you have a text, which is uh, which are information gathered by the internet, uh, on the internet. But the problem is that they don't have filters. They don't know if it's a fake news or not fake news. So the issue here is that a human probably can judge and can, when he, he writes, has an ethical code to follow. AI doesn't have any ethical codes. AI is already biased. So this is going to be a big, big issue, which we should focus now. For example, uh, MSN is going to uh, actually free 50 freelance news editor from July 1st, because they are going to substitute them with systems, with robots. And the point is that the question to ask is, uh, will artificial intelligence put journalists out of work? Probably yes. Or, as I said before, creativity. If you manage, even if you're not a journalist, but if you manage to know how to use the tool, so how to new, uh, use artificial intelligence, probably you're going not only to survive, but you are going to have a big leverage respect, I mean, compared to the others. You remember I said that already news anchor are replaced by artificial intelligence? Watch this. 现场的各位朋友,大家好,欢迎来到新华社,我是由新华社和苏狗公司联合培育的全球首个AI合成女主播。我的名字叫新小萌。我的声音和外形脱胎于新华社新媒体中心新闻主播区盲。我将会在今年全国两会期间与大家见面。我和我的搭档将为大家带来更好的新闻体验。so it's very, let's say, profitable. At the same time, we are losing, again, we are losing the human touch. And also, it could be really a way of manipulating the news. So it's something that, in my opinion, we should reflect on. Then AI is also entering with a very strong force in advertisement. Why? Because, for example, you remember that focus group, focus group were at the base of that advertisement. Now, what the majority of advertising companies are starting to use face recognition. What is that? You have many software available that with the camera and the computer, they can read the small lines of your face, something that the human eye cannot see, but something that gives you the impression of the emotion of the person you are looking at, disgust, happiness, and etc. These emotions are done by these little lines that the camera and the software can read. So advertisers are using a lot of face, face recognition software. Why? Because they have the possibility to really test the, probably the success of a campaign or the strength of that campaign. Then they use also, uh, no, uh, besides that, I would like to mention this, that face recognition started something that probably you have heard of, which is called deep fake. If you don't know what is deep fake, deep fake is a sort of extension of fake news, 
but done in video. Um, here I have a video that explains you how deep fake is created and generated. Therefore, you know this footage. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. But what about this? I will not be resigning the presidency at noon tomorrow because I am not Richard Nixon. In fact, I'm Jake Ward. I'm a television correspondent. And the fact that my face can be put onto the late presidents and do a pretty good job of fooling you, well, that's a sign of just how much trouble we're all in. You see, I would never say these things. Someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. Made by a hostile nation just for laughs? It doesn't matter. Deep fakes are good enough to fool anyone. So good that Twitter, Facebook, Google, and both political parties are scrambling for ways to fight them. There are many examples of deep fake which started, of course, uh, to, to, to actually create some issues with uh, very, very well-known uh, uh, actors because they started putting faces of actresses on naked bodies. And, uh, but actually, um, advertisement and uh, also marketing campaign are starting to use deep fake for good, which is a project I'm working on for Webster. And actually, I would like to show you a very good project on deep fake for good, which is, uh, has, uh, has been done by uh, a museum in Spain. It's a video of three minutes long. But I think it's very important to see because you can really understand where technology is going. Greetings. I am Salvador Felipe Jacinto Dali y Domenech. And I am back. Even though Dolly's been gone for 30 years, we're using artificial intelligence to bring him back today. In order to actually train this AI to, to reproduce Dolly's likeness, we've started with finding the right footage of Dolly. And then we split that up into frames where he's, he's looking the right way. And we pick the best frames to use for training from that. Our system learns exactly what he looks like and how his his mouth moves and how his eyes move and his eyebrows and every little detail about what makes Dali Dali. This is actually a recreated version of Dali. It's not a person playing Dali with makeup. It is actually Dali. It's very careful to use his words um, so that you learn a lot about what he thought and the way he thought. People want access to art. They want a way in. It can be through technology, through learning about the artist. Greetings. Welcome. This technology allows people to imagine for a moment that there is such a thing as immortality, to see Dolly alive again. <laughs> the whole future of Dali is explained in the roller painting. I saw Dali, but like his actual form, full figure, speaking personally to me. I was welcome into the museum to see his art and like I still have this one. It is good to be back. Um, he talked about the museum and his paintings. Their cool moment in every person's life nice when they realize they are told that your life this moment will also be known as what you think. Go tell it to your chart. Mr. Dali, <laughs> very life. Before you leave, you will take a picture with me? Sure. Alor. Uno. Dos. Tres. Uno. 
is a sense of emotion. If they can empathize with this man as a human being, then they can relate to the work much more directly, much more passionately. To understand the art, you need to understand the artists behind the art. And this, this technique allows visitors of the Dali Museum to do just that. So it was a video, uh, it was a museum in the Uni uh, United States, not in Barcelona. Barcelona has, uh, is, uh, in Figueroa, near Barcelona has his uh, museum. But I think it gives you really the strength of technology today and actually the possibility to use technology also for good. Uh, you know that uh, the first technology that actually we discovered is the fire. Because before the fire, uh, we were a minute, so four legs, and uh, we saw the fire and we were really afraid of it. Uh, we used to eat, um, uh, we used to hunt for 12 hours and then eat and digest for the other 12. But then the hominids embraced the technology and they managed to make them, make the technology theirs. So they started to light up the cave, they started to push away ferocious animals, they started to warm themselves, but they actually started to cook food, which gave them the possibility of having more free time because their food cooked was not so heavy to digest and it was more nutrient. So uh, the food cooked gave nutrients to the brain which developed in a better way. And they had the possibility also to stand up because the digestion was not so heavy and they became homo erectus. So technology actually is um, helping evolution. We should not be afraid of it. And we should know technology. It's the only way to not to be afraid of technology. Back to our advertisement and uh, the implication of AI, they also use advertisement also use neuromarketing. What is neuromarketing? It's an application of neuroscience which uses images to see how the brain reacts to images in order to gather data. Um, another issue that I would like to touch uh, regarding uh, trends uh, in for digital marketing in 2020 is extended reality. What is the meaning of that? Extended reality means the combination of three realities, which are augmented reality, probably you know that, um, which is uh, something, some digital objects or information that are superimposed on your reality. And you have to, to in order to, to, to see them, to experience them, you have to have a device, which is or a smartphone or a tablet. This is augmented reality. Actually, now many company, companies are using augmented reality. I have a lot of examples. I didn't have the time to show you today. Uh, uh, for example, one that comes to mind is IKEA. You go to IKEA or no, you have your catalog of IKEA and you have a little bar uh, on the on, on a site which you can scan about a product and then you can show you can see the product in your living room and you can also rotate in order to see if it fits or not so many companies are starting to use augmented reality which is also not so e difficult to make because now you have templates to create that i use it myself for an event then besides augmented reality, you have what? Virtual reality. I don't know if you experienced virtual reality. Uh, usually my students do, and actually they have a cardboard, which is a, a very inexpensive way to experience virtual reality because I want, when I talk about something, I really want the students to have a concrete and uh, physical uh, 
um, uh, experience of that. So virtual reality is uh, some a reality that is recreated by um, or computer or it's filmed and it's uh, completely recreated. You see it in a device if you never see virtual, you have never experienced virtual reality and you have it in a device and you can turn because it's 360. The only issue if you have, if you never experienced and if you did, I would like to actually know what did you experience is that the fact at the beginning you feel a sort of nausea. Why? Because the brain really doesn't understand what's going on. You see something, you see a reality, but you don't see yourself because the rea reality is recreated. So it's something that needs to be really worked on still. But journalism is actually, and advertisement, both are actually um, uh, engaging in virtual reality. Because for example, imagine, and New York Times is doing that a lot. Imagine that you read an article about a war in Syria you can really experience, unfortunately, what is it? Because you have the possibility to be with virtual reality inside the location, 360, meaning that it's not anymore an immersive experience, it's a being present experience. Same for advertisement, same for a marketing communication, could be very interested in it starting to be used. The third one, it's in my opinion, the most interesting one, it's called mixed reality. And here I have again, another example, because I think videos work better than, works better than my words or images. This is HoloLens. This means that you have this device, you see your ambience, but you have really lots of content, digital content on it. And they are starting to use it for sports, for example, meaning that you have a game and then you can have information and the game in front. I mean, as I said, this is just a taste of what I actually teach because I, I need lots of time. But I have a lot of examples that makes you reflect on how communication is impacting, how technology is impacting communication. And uh, probably uh, the last thing that I would like to mention, and I cannot fail to mention it because it's very important. Imagine what could do this technology. It's digital humans. I don't know if you know what are digital humans, but I think you remember a movie called Her was like five years, six years ago. And it, it was a man falling in love with his uh, digital assistant. And there was only the voice, but the technology went far. So of course, I'm giving you only the spices and not giving you really the content, 
but I don't have too much time. And I would like to tell you that it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives, is the one that is the most adaptable to change. Change, what is change? How communication will change in the future? And how communication and the change of communication is going to impact actually digital marketing? And how are you going to manage digital marketing if you do not have the knowledge of what's go going on with emerging technologies? So this is a, briefly what I focus on. As I said, I gave you only the spies. I didn't give you the content. Uh, but this is what I'm going to, what my course uh, in uh, digital marketing management is going to focus on. I finished. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any question, I will be happy. To thank you. Thank you very much, Nicoletta. It's really enlightening. I mean, the, the picture that you, is, I think it's very important. I have a lot of enthusiasm. I mean, uh, you, you, you may be very positive. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, for sure, we, we, we have uh, some questions. So the floor is open. Yeah. If you have some questions, please uh, jump. I'm here for you. Question. I have a question. Yes, thank you. Hi, Ron. Hi, I'm Ron. I also teach marketing at Webster. <clears throat> um, you mentioned that creativity will be the number one skill uh, to have in the 21st century. What are the three best ways you feel is the best way to develop creativity? Okay. How do you develop creativity? Um, because I mean, we, you know, if we're going to teach, we need to teach our students to think critically. We need to get them to think out of the box or the box away, whatever you want to call it. But to be creativity, I mean, to be creative. So what I, three I, things can we do to improve that? First of all, in my opinion, but this is my opinion, my personal opinion. First of all, is to, um, uh, to, to uh, enhance or to recognize what you are passionate about. Because usually creativity is connected with passion and with enthusiasm. Um, uh, there is a very interesting talk, TED talk with Elizabeth Gilbert, which talks about creativity. And she says something that stayed in my mind very, uh, very fixed. Uh, because um, she says that creativity is a kind of force that arrives, enters in you, and goes. You have to be very careful to take it, to uh, catch it to write down what she says, what uh, this force is giving you. So, in my opinion, creativity, again, is, uh, first of all, it's a, a little bit long discussion, but I need to mention what my actual research is focused on, because I deal a lot with technology, and emerging technology, and uh, I deal with the dichotomy of, and the difference between uh, human being and being human uh, and technology if it affects a human being <clears throat> who's a human being is the homo sapiens species is that the, uh, the the animal in quote that can stand straight that can actually verbalize thoughts and has the brain more developed uh, if technology affects the human being it's just accelerating evolution. But if technology in fact being human, what is being human? Being human is our essence, is the possibility of being mesmerized by a sunset or being taken away by music or a feeling uh, generosity, compassion, empathy, etc. So if technology affects that, it's a big loss because we, lo we risk to lose our humanness. So, to make it shorter, creativity 
belongs and depend on our humanness. So in order to uh, teach creativity, in my opinion, it's not possible to teach creativity. You can reawake, you can reboot creativity. I think everybody is creative. It's just a matter of understanding what is the passion and to not to be taken away too much by technology, but actually enhance the humanness. This is what I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a question? Yes. Nicoletta, thank you so much for the presentation. This was uh, this was really a, a great overview for those of us that don't engage with the front, the forefront of technology every day. Um, question: Going back to your comments about open AI, I yeah. was very scared by this idea that uh, intelligence can replicate the voice of those whom we trust. So, if there's a columnist in the New York Times that has a certain writing style that uh, somehow the, the computers can now simulate new content in the style of, of another human being. And of course, we know that they can do this with graphics of uh, images of people. And I'm wondering about the human voice, because I know that voices are complex, uh, but the technologies have advanced so far. Um, if they can do images and they can do voice, and then they can also sort of create content in the voice of, you know, simulating the intellect of, of a particular person, the, the communication style of a particular person, then essentially uh, this deep fake gets to a whole new level as far as I could see. Is that is that right? That marketing agencies yeah, could almost I mean, simulate a friend of I, yours recommending a product, even if the friend of yours never used the product. Uh, that's the point. I showed the video, and this is an old video. Now the technology is becoming better. You know, technology is always refined itself very fast. Technology is growing exponentially. Our brain is still working linear. This is our problem, which technology goes like that, and we are like linear, very steady in a sense. But I showed in the video that it's becoming could become a tool, a, a weapon, because uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm doing as I said, I'm doing this research for Webster on deep fake for good, and uh, there is a Chinese software that allows you, and I'm going to put it in my research, to actually upload your pictures, some of your pictures, and you pay only $20, something like that. And after a few hours, you have a video with your face. I'm trying to do, you remember, probably you know, Ava Gartner when she does the glass. Gilda, okay? I'm doing that because I want to show how easy it is that you can do it at home. So, you cannot prevent that. The only way to actually prevent that technologists will be aware of that and try to find a tool that recognizes. And also, everybody needs to know, because before believing, you need to know what is, uh, what's going on with technology. My point is that the kind of only way that the regular citizen has towards technology, towards the, the, the fast growing of technology, is knowledge. It's knowledge. This is why I'm stressing a lot on this. My students know, because sometimes probably I go a little bit not completely in the point, but I think these notions are very important to know. And actually, I finished a course yesterday and students sent incredible um, feedback because they can really implement this general knowledge in um, not only in what they are going to be or do in the future, but in their personal life. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for all of the questions, so do not hesitate. Going to ask a quick question. <clears throat> Brian, when 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 looking at deep fake and all of the uh, the pace of change in technology and how quickly things are evolving, and then we look at the glacial pace of change and reaction from 
policy laws and and governments how do you how do you reconcile without being just reactive as a as a government or a an organization dealing with technology that changes too quickly for the you know the fact that we just can't laws don't keep up uh creating awareness is the only way that you can do it again because how can you do it in a, if you if you see governments they don't know what's going on uh, a kid a 13 years old kid knows more than government in technology so my point and my actual now is becoming a mission is just to create awareness i'm not judging when i say ethics i'm just creating awareness and posing few questions on the positive and negative consequences because at the end if we are especially bringing it to school if you as an individual know what's going on maybe you can do something i know it's grassroots and it's not top down but there is no other way because believe me i tried in my little space to work with italy but i mean they have to change mindset because uh, once after two years they say yes they say yes to something that is completely obsolete so the only way is to change completely paradigm or to change completely uh, project in quote go grassroots and try to make as much as possible people aware of what's going on this is my answer unfortunately or I become Joan d'Arc, I'm going to start to kill everybody. Can I ask a question? Please. This is, this is Miho. Um, thank you for your um, lecture. I did a little bit of research um, on AI actually a couple months ago, and I learned that maybe there are two obstacles to, for AI to develop more. One is just, uh, I think Brian mentioned the regulation, for example, that uh, it's auto, uh, auto driving system. I heard that it's almost, uh, it's uh, surpassing human. However, for example, there's uh, four people in the car and the car sees one person crossing the street and uh, which, which uh, the car should take decision, whether stop or you know hit the one person to save four people in the car. I heard that because there's no regu yeah, uh, there's no uh, because there's no regulation on this. That's why the uh, this automating uh, driving system has not released in everywhere in the street. Um, yeah, I wanted to point out this one. And also, what do you think about the bias when you create algorithm? of uh, AI. I heard that our human brain is uh, naturally like to categorize when we memorize and when we take a judgment. And it's impos almost impossible to take away our prejudice, but we could work uh, hard on that uh, to conquer that uh, the bias situation. But I heard that, for example, that uh, I, I learned that uh, duplex, was it? No, I forgot the name of the Google, the hearing no. system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's quite, uh, it's a surpassed human level. I, I was very impressed with the level. However, you know, the lack of human's voice, I mean, the women's voice or the Asian's voice, and how do you, uh, I would like to know about your thoughts on how Actually, uh, the AI system, that. yeah, Actually, is I'm working to... on that. Okay. Uh, let me give you first my opinion on the first question you made. Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem in uh, self-driver's cars is that we are trying to, we are still working with linear. We cannot combine self-driving cars with human cars together on the street. Okay. They won't match because mm -hmm. human serendipity, again, they mm -hmm. won't match. You want to use self-driver's car, you mm -hmm. need to have only them on the street. And then everything is going to be fine. Otherwise, in my opinion, there is no way. Mm -hmm. The other issue is gender bias and AI. And here I can talk a little bit more about it because first of all, I'm creating an hackathon, which is going to be in November, uh, no, in September, because I belong to a nonprofit called uh, Women Brain Project. We try to advocate the fact that mental illness is um, the majority for women, 
but the actual medicine is developed for men. So there is a big discrepancy. Okay. Yeah. I ran a, a, a gender bias um, a panel last year during our forum, and I actually had Sophia, the robot, coming and to discuss that. That was pretty interesting. But this year I'm going to create an hackathon. And how to do that? Because uh, you cannot really work on algorithms that are already done. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, technology, and here I don't want to be feminist on anything, but technology has been developed for the majority by men who they think with their mind. For example, at the beginning of Siri, uh, if um, uh, you asked Siri, Siri, I got my period, I need to go to the pharmacy. Siri didn't know what was the meaning. Because, yeah, okay. of course, a man doesn't think about it. Like, we do mm -hmm. not think about something else. Mm -hmm. The point is that men and women should work on technology, number one. Yeah. And number two, for the hackathon, how to solve the problem. I don't know if I can solve the problem, but I will try to actually start to impacting the problem. I'm going to create a, an algorithm that is going to be really biased, really badly biased. Then I'm going to have groups working, and these groups should really deconstruct the algorithm and see how the bias is impacting. And then they are going to do a kind of result. Then we are going to combine all these results in a paper that we are going to publish. And then this paper will be given to university as a guideline to actually people that are going to develop algorithms. I know it's nothing. It's probably a drop in the ocean. But I just wanted to tell you that for mm -hmm. me, it's something very dear. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you so much. Thank you, Miho, for your question. I mean, Welcome. it's uh, 7.27. I mean, we can go for another last question. So if there is a still one question, I mean, do not hesitate, please. I think. Maybe a last one, if you allow me. I'm just yes. curious. You, you, you made, um, in Connect Time, you, you, you talked a lot about SCP, and I think it's a, it's a very positive perspective. Um, can you tell us about the, the possible new job that we can have in the future thanks to AI, especially in the field of marketing? So, can you imagine a few new job, new positions? Now, in my opinion, the jobs are not going to change a lot, Dominic. Uh, probably they will be kind of interdisciplinary. My point is that when you are working in the marketing scenario, you need to know that today you have different tools. You don't have the regular tools that you, we used to have a few years ago. Now we have different tools that we can engage with. But in my opinion, the, the, the jobs are not re going to really change a lot, I think. I have to tell you that I didn't consider that. Probably this is a, a very good point of reflection for me once we actually close this call. Nicoletta, thank you very much. Again, it was really uh, fascinating. I mean, uh, you, you obviously, you know very well the topic and uh, you have transfer a lot to us. So it was very beneficial for, for all of us. So thank you very much. I wish you all the best. A nice evening to all of you. Thank you for listening to those presentations. And I hope we will meet again next week. Same address, same time. A new speaker from uh, Webster University. Have a nice evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Ciao, ciao.